So the question then becomes, what are the ways to reduce the chance of, of a deal going bad, okay? And so what I wanna ask the question is, how do banks do it? So how do banks make sure a deal doesn't go bad? Because I think this is important for us to understand how banks kind of protect their interest so that we can protect our own interest when we are also doing the deals. How do banks do it? Go ahead. Reviewing income, reviewing debts, okay. reviewing credit to know what the chances you're gonna pay your loan on. So they're, they're profiling you. What else are they doing? Appraising the property. Appraising the property. What else are they doing? Assume the worst case scenario. Assu oh, some assume the worst case scenario. Okay, what else? Oh, you're missing a big one. Taking down payment? Big down payments. It's a big one, right? Like if you have 20% in a deal, are you going to walk away from, let's say it's a, let's say it's a $200,000 investment, which is a nothing house right now. Are you guys, any of you going to walk away from $40,000? I'm not. Right? So when you have skin in the game, you're going to make better decisions and you're probably not going to do it. Why do you think that, that uh, hard money lenders, they always make you have at least 10%. You got to have skin in the game, right? If you don't have skin in the game, then I'm just gonna provide the keys. So where do you think the biggest foreclosures and delinquencies end up becoming in? FHA, Chaffa, all the ones where they got 3% down, this and that. What they, we, got, we got screwed previous and back in 2004 with the Ninja loans. Remember what Ninja stood for? No income, no job. Yeah, no income, no job, something, right? It's like these loans that like, they literally did not even screen you they had negative amortization because they assumed that prices were gonna to continue to go up. And then you get surprised when we have a housing crisis. Now we're not to that level because so many of the loans with Dodd-Frank and things like that force you to have 20% down. But the people that are going to be struggle with it are the ones that are Chaffa, FHA, because they really don't have that much invested. And not only that, but they gotta pay PMI, they, gotta, like, they have a higher interest rate because they don't have as much skin in the game. Does that make sense? So that's how banks do it. How do flippers do it? How do flippers reduce the chance of a deal going bad? Go ahead, Brandon. Uh, buy a good deal. Buy a good deal, right? What is a good deal? Uh, significantly low below uh, market value. So li significantly below market value. That's right. Anyone else know how flippers do it? They have resources that they pay. Usually, you know, probably they don't have general contractors that have the owner pool that they pay. Sure. Okay. So it could be that I basically am able to absorb some of the maintenance as it. So Warren, let me ask you a question. How do you st stop a flip from being bad? Buying right. So the correct answer is buying right. Say no to a lot. So Warren's my business partner. We do some flips together and uh, we don't have any right now because we can't find a deal that has enough value in it to reduce our risk to a level where we're comfortable with it. Right? If the market goes down, all these flippers and everyone else are gonna be screwed. They're gonna lose everything. Uh, there's a guy that I know who was a flipper in Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix is a beautiful place. Do you guys know what happened to Phoenix circa <coughs> 2008? Anyone remember what happened to Las Vegas and Phoenix and a bunch of those places? They lost 50% of his value. 50% of the value. This guy had tried to be good. He had 50% equity in all of his deals. He was a multimillionaire. I met him when he was renting a property from my parents. He lost everything, everything. He had too many projects that were uncompleted that he couldn't sell. He had to give it all to the bank, right? So like margin of safety and risk is super important. Say no to way more deals than you say yes to. Super important, okay? Now, how do buy and hold investors do it? How do we reduce the chance of a deal going bad? You want to make sure you can pay for it. That's the biggest thing. I think is you can pay for your mortgage and every, all the other expenses. You won't lose it. Correct. So what I would argue on that is have an unlimited time horizon. My dad has made multi-millions of dollars, and he was a teacher's salary. Let me ask you guys a question here. I know your population's a little bit different, but my dad, when he started off years and years ago, was probably making $10,000 a year as a teacher. So when he finished, I think the most he was making was maybe $50,000. How does a man that's only making $50,000 when he finishes his teaching career after 30 years acquire a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio? Like how? How? Like seriously, like, like how is this even possible? It shouldn't be. 
But the reason why is because he did what is necessary. He held a property forever. He's only sold three properties in his life. One was to me, one was to a friend of the family, and one was a property in Hartford. What do you think that tells you about Hartford? Don't buy in Hartford. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so like have an unf infinite horizon. What does that mean? He used to say things, and this is what you need to be thinking about right now. I, I thought it was a terrible thing, but now it's a true statement. He said, if I only have to subsidize this property by $300 a month in 30 years, it'll be paid off, right? If I only have to have negative cash flow to pay this property off, I'll have it paid off in 30 years. He had a long-term hold mentality, and he was able to do it because of that. So buy and hold, if you want to reduce the chance of a deal going bad, you have to have an expectation that I'm going to hold this property forever, okay? So what does that mean for me? It means I'm not buying in Hartford. I'm not buying in Waterbury. I'm not going to buy in a place that's going to beat me up so bad that I want to sell, okay? That doesn't mean I buy in West Hartford. I buy in Middletown, solid C plus area, right? I just don't buy in C and D areas, right? So buy things that you want to hold long term and you're going to make money on it because like my dad, you hold forever and you'll make multi-millions of dollars, okay? Okay, so we're going to go through this one hopefully a little bit quicker because I am, I am going slow and hopefully you guys are getting a lot of education on this already. But there's three approaches to real estate, uh, evaluating real estate and appraisals, okay? So the sales approach or market approach, who knows what that is? What? It's the ARV, right? Generally, the ARV flipping is really based on the market approach, and so it's what other similar properties are selling for. So that's what you want to know. Single family homes, two family homes, they more are weighted towards sales approach and market approach. You want to know that because you want to know how to evaluate the deals. Where is it, what is cost approach and where do cost approach properties generally lie? Anyone? Cost to rebuild. Co cost to rebuild. Right? So it's going to be a property that you buy that doesn't have a lot of similar properties and or have a lot of income from other, court, uh, other, other places. So what, are, what, would, what could you get a loan on for cost approach? There would be churches, there would be schools, there would be things like that that maybe don't have a traditional valuation because it's not based on the land, but maybe what you're doing with the land, right? Like I've got a, a congregation of parishioners paying tithes to basically then support the, this loan. And then what is income approach? Anyone? Income. So it's based on the income approach, it's based on cap rates, or it's based on a percentage of the revenue. You could say the 1% rule. They have all sorts of ways of doing that. The appraisers generally look at it and they say, okay, what is your total rent? And they assume a cap rate. And so from that, they, they end up getting a, a valuation. So when you're buying big apartment buildings, it all skews towards the income approach. When you buy single family homes, it all goes to the sales approach because that's ba basically the bank's doing it and how people think about the physical asset, okay? So this is how banks lend, right? They basically identify the approach that they want. They're gonna do, generally it's a fixed loan. You can have 30 year, 20 year, or 15 year amortizations, right? That's the principal and interest that you're paying on a reoccurring basis over the life of the loan. Now, as you get to the income approach where it's commercial buildings, it becomes more based on adjustable rate mortgage options, okay? I know of two major ones. There might be some more. I didn't do that much research, but I have a home equity line of credit. So a home equity line of credit is you have equity on your property, and essentially they give you um, a, a valuation of it. It's, it's basically a line of credit where I can ultimately use that to buy property, to go on vacations, to buy a boat, to do whatever I want. You could do whatever you want with it. One of the things about it, though, is it changes monthly, right? If the interest rate, the Fed luckily didn't raise the interest rate yesterday, but if they had, then ultimately my home equity line of credit would have gone up t tomorrow because ultimately it changes as the Fed changes the interest rate, okay? Now, commercial loans, we have what we call the DSCR loans, the debt service coverage ratio loans, and they will change every period, be it three years, five years, seven years, or 10 years, okay? So what does that mean? So that means you're fixed for a period of time. When that period of time is over, it's gonna vary, okay? And then you're ultimately gonna be locked in at another rate, or you can choose to refinance. Any questions on that? There's no DSCR loan that are fixed 30 year long. There are. 
There, there could be. Yeah, there are. But like, the I, rate's higher, it's a lot higher, right? It's, yeah. it's a lot higher, right? And so Fannie, Freddie, all of those loans, when it comes to fixed loans, really keep the interest rate quite a bit lower. I know that for me, I bought a big commercial building last in November. It, we did it on a 25-year amortization, right? So what that means is it's like I'm paying it off for 25 years. That's the principal portion. And I did it on a five-year basis because I wasn't sure where the rates were going to be in three years. And I basically have four periods to pay back. So, I have a, so basically, I go to 20 years. So the bank is guaranteeing as long as I continue to make my payments, they're willing to lend to me for that duration. Okay. Now, year 20, they're not willing to lend me any, any further. So at that point, we would have a balloon loan and we'd have to pay off the remainder of the five years. Okay. Does that make sense, guys? So this is how banks do it, right? And now here's the other question. With the DS, did it, was there a question? Can you refinance that property with a balloon? Uh, with a balloon? When you're talking about, like, for the commercial loans? When you're talking about, like, for the commercial loans? You can. Now, my commercial loan with the five years, I'll have a prepayment penalty of a few points if I don't last at least one, one period. Okay. So we're going to do five years. But yeah, absolutely, you can refinance. And that's the goal. We're trying to make the property operate better so that then we can refinance, get all of our money out and additional equity and still have a, a cash flowing property. Go ahead. How do you make sure that, you know, I mean, that if you're buying a property today, I mean, I guess it kind of goes back to your maximum offer, but to make sure that you have the ability to refinance, like the equity is there. Well, so, so there, well, 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 okay, good question. Okay, so DSCR loans. So there's two equations to the DSCR loan. So frequently the banks are going to lend based on this thing. And usually the DSCR loan is about 1.2 times, 1.2x. So if you want to raise the equity that you have in the property because it's based on the income approach, it's about increasing your NOI, right? You're adding back the CapEx and income tax, but you raise the NOI or you decrease your principal and interest payment. Right, but I'm just, I'm talking more of like the value of the property. Like well, but the again, the equity's not there. The value the of the property comes from the income. Not, but I mean, it still needs to appraise. With DSCR, it still needs to, generally, so, it still needs to so, appraise. So, add, well, you could say that, but again, the appraisals are based on these approaches. And if it's a big commercial building, it's going to be based on the income approach. So as an example, so let me explain, because I think there's a little bit of confusion. So I bought this property for about one and a half million dollars, okay? In 1989, they did a renovation of the property. Guess how much money they did, they put into that property to renovate it. Pretty much brand new from the ground up. Guess how much they put into it? In 1989 dollars. 200? Two million? Okay, that's closer. Three million dollars. So I bought a property in 2023 dollars for one and a half million dollars that someone in 1989 dollars spent three million dollars on. I have it. I have literally all of the tax returns that show what, their, what the depreciation continued to be after those 30 years. And I just back calculated and I'm like, holy crap, that's a lot of money, right? So going back to your point, is my property only worth 1.5 million dollars? Literally in 1989, it was $3 million. So you would think that, and that's because you're thinking about it from a cost approach perspective, but really it's just about the income that I produce. So if I'm producing more income such that my DSCR becomes 2.0, I could probably refinance it back to 1.2. Make sense? Okay, so that's the point. So if we want to outperform in the assets that we have, we need to figure out ways to increase the net operating income or get lucky and have the principal and interest payment, AKA the mortgage, actually the interest rate go down so that we have a higher DSCR and we can lend more. Why do you think everything went up so high on the commercial space? Because the principal and interest went down so they could buy, uh, uh, buy a lower NOI, which basically means that, they're, that the purchase price went up. Does that make, go ahead. Mine, it's about, it's about 40 something commercial units. It's about 25,000 square feet. 1.625, but yeah. How much you put up for closing? My partner and I, 25%. We've also put in $200,000 into renovating it. And we're gonna put another 200,000 in next year. We're making it nice. 
If you have one office space, I got some more available. <laughs> so, um, does any other questions? I saw another hand. I'm sorry. Sure. So mo mostly multifamily are appraised on income generation. So, so when you have like a, another multifamily, but it needs some work. Do like do I evaluate it by like burr, or do I evaluate it by how much money it could possibly produce? We'll talk about that. Perfect. Is, is it just more or less commercial, which is what five or more goes with your NOI? So with yeah. Range, so. It's a great question. So when, anytime you're four and below, it's gonna, there's enough four and below families that it's going to be based on sales approach. As you get more to 20, 30 unit buildings, so if you have an eight, they might partly do both. They're all going to, they play a game and they're gonna, it's going to be magic that whatever you offer is going to be exactly the appraised value. It's, it, everyone is geniuses, right? If you've ever seen it, oh, I bid 425000 it's worth exactly 425000 It's all just a big game that everyone plays. I always joke with any of my clients, I'm saying, you're a genius. You bid exactly the amount that it's worth. Well, guess what? If you bid 25000 less, it would have been worth exactly that much. So, um, so, so again, so the DSCR loans are going to lend based on the historical assets per, asset performance, not you. So if I'm basically got a 500 credit score, but I have a lot of money because my uncle died, for instance, and left me a lot of money, I can buy big, big apartment buildings. Because it's not really based on me. It is to a certain level because they want to guarantee their money, right? They're definitely running your credit, but it's not as much based on that. It's more based on the, the asset performance. And so if I manage a property really well, such that I can increase my NOI, which I'm doing on this property, we got it filled a lot better, then ultimately I'm gonna have a higher debt service coverage ratio and in five years I'm gonna be able to refinance it, get all of my money out plus more. So my business partner and I expect that in five years we'll probably double the value from 1.625 to 3 million and we'll probably each take home something like half a million dollars. So where there is bigger properties, there's bigger rewards. There's also bigger risks, okay? This guy makes sense, guys? Okay. So DSCR loans usually have to have a 1.2x or higher ratio. If you increase your income and or lower your expenses, DSCR goes up. Syndication investors make all their wealth when refinancing, not on cash flow. So that's really an interesting thing that I learned. I'm a cash flow person. But you look at the Grant Cardones and all these other people, they don't make any money on cash flow. They make money on basically continuing to get more money out of the bank. One of the beautiful things about that is, let's say, for instance, that I refinance it for $3 million and I get an extra, my buddy and I get an extra million dollars. How much tax are we paying on that? Why not? I just got a million dollars. You only do it, it's a loan. You only do it when you sell. So a lot of the richest people, the billionaires, they don't sell their stock. They take a loan from a bank against their stock. And then because it's a loan, they don't pay anything. They don't pay any taxes on it. And they can have billions of dollars, OK? So it's the same concept. So syndication investors don't make cash flow. I know a bunch of really well-heeled investors that have 200 plus unit buildings, apartment buildings. And what they do is periodically they refinance and they pull all their cash out and then they take it and they invest in Tesla, they invest in whatever they want and they make a ton of money, okay? Now, on the flip side of this, if we lower income and or we increase expenses, the DSCR goes down. What's happening right now, guys, with the principal and interest portion? Oops. What's going on right now with principal and interest in, uh, in, in uh, the country? It's going up. So what, in this equation, what's happening to the DSCR? Going down. Now, what also is happening to the NOI on these big commercial buildings that are office space? What's going on? Is the net operating income staying fixed? What are you hearing about office buildings? What? Higher vacancy. So if you have a higher vacancy, what's happening to your net operating income? It's lowering. So not only is the, so the top part of this equation is going down, and the bottom side of the equation is going up. So what's happening to the DSCR relation? DSCR going down a lot. So what happens in five years when the debt service coverage ratio occurs, and I end up having to refinance? I can't cover my debt. So guess what's happening? So Blackstone Group just sold out one of their flagship properties at like 50 cents on the dollar because they know that they're not going to be able to support this and they're trying to get out. They're not allowing redemptions from their people to pull their money out, right? All this is happening, right? So 
what's happening then is these properties can't sell. And so I think there's going to be significant capitulation in the real estate market, specifically because of commercial. It's about a $1 trillion thing that's going to come in the next two years. This very likely is what will crash our economy, is the commercial real estate market and what's about to happen. They don't, you know why they don't tell you about this stuff? Because if, if they tell you about this, what happens to people? They get scared. What happens when they get scared? They start to do, change their behavior, and it definitely happens. So all of the economists that tell you that things are going well, do it because they have to lie to you because if they tell you what they really feel, it's going to happen, right? So they're threading, literally, they're talking about how threading a needle is because of all this stuff. And it's likely that it could possibly not happen, but there's going to be some capitulation. I'm curious to see whether or not they turn on the money printer again in a year or two. Like that's where I'm looking, so I am starting to hoard cash a little bit, guys. Now, residential is going to continue to happen. You don't have to worry about that. It's really in office space. It's pretty a unique place where we used to have historically about 10% vacancy. Now we have closer to 20% vacancy, and people are about to lose their shirts. Okay? You know what's funny? It's off topic, but um, I heard that a lot of big companies are bringing their employees back because of political pressure. Right to have folks back in the office and uh, the restaurants, the communities around that, right to bring them back up. So I'm here. There's a lot of political pressure from you know. And it very well could be for the same exact reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, very well could be. All right, cool. Uh, so then, so that's the DSCR ratio, right? That's basically how banks are evaluating these deals. So now we go into how do we evaluate real estate and it with flips, okay? So we want to, and, and I think John basically talked about it, 0.7 times this and this, because he's a, you know, he basically is a, a straight A student, right? So we have the ARV, so that's the market approach for a single family. We're going to generate a work scope and cost to complete the work scope. We have the MAO, the maximum allowable offer. We determine using one of a few methods, okay? So we have, and, and John talked about besides his wholesale fee, right, and that we can put in as well. But the MAO is your ARV, it's your, uh, your um, after repair value, minus your fixed costs, right? So what are your fixed costs in this case, guys? What's fixed costs when we end up calculating this kind of stuff? Anyone have any idea? So this would be your debt service, this would be your taxes, this would be your insurance, this would be... Um, your closing costs with your lawyer and paying your realtor fees, those are fixed costs, okay? And then we have our repair costs, and those are obviously the costs to repair. And then you could say your desired profit. So if you have a million dollar property, I'm sorry, but you're not gonna be able to use this, this equation, right? Because there's too much at stake that someone's gonna allow on a million dollar property someone to make $300,000. You're gonna have a compression ultimately in, in this and, and it's because of the fact that there's more people that are willing to, to support these huge deals because there's more money that can be made, okay? But for most deals, this is a really good analysis or a really good way of evaluating it. This is how I evaluate, evaluate flips. So it's your NAO equals your ARV times 0.7. So let's say you're at $100,000 just to make our numbers really, really uh, simple. So if you're, if you're $100,000 ARV, so times 0.7, so $70,000, and let's say it's $20,000 in repair costs, so that means we should only offer 50,000, right? So it would be 100,000 times 0.7 is 70,000, minus repair costs of 20, means your maximum allowable offer should be 50,000. Does that make sense, guys? And so you're giving yourself a basically about $30,000 of, of, of ability to, to make money. Now, but I, but I just asked the question, I said, yeah, but that's your repair costs. What about your fixed costs? So in that point seven is all of those things like your debt service, like your closing costs. So you have to do deals really fast because otherwise your debt service can start to swamp things, right? So that's what we need to do when we're doing this. So that's what I'm saying. 30% margin includes your fixed costs um, and profit and some small amount for risk, right? We always want to budget somewhere around 10 to 20% above and beyond what we expect the repair costs to be. Because unfortunately, this, that it, it does happen. Shit does happen. So, and then hard money lenders right now they lend at something like 10 to 13 percent yearly interest and two to three points. You guys know what points are? Everyone know? Anyone have a question about points? What points are? We good? P points. So basically, for the ability for me to lend you, so so hard money lenders they don't make money on the interest. 
So I have a bunch of money. I have $100 million, and I want to lend it. They're going to tell me, I'm going to give you 10% on the money that I lend to you. So I'm going to say, okay, that sounds great. So I'm going to give them a bunch of money. So they're going to give me that 10%, but they're going to take a percentage of the money through the points. So they make all their money on points, and they borrow money and give that back to the lenders. So usually they don't even have their own money at play. They have someone else's money. So Sam, is it safe to say that usually with points, it's 1% of what the property is worth? I would say no. It's usually 2 to 3, especially right now. I, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Each point is a percent. So exactly correct, yeah. But right now it's 2 to 3 points usually. So let's say that you start a property and you finish it the next day. You're still going to pay 3%, 2 to 3%. Even though you have no, the, 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 the loan was not out. And people do that. Like I have people that literally pay me for the right for me to give them money and then give it right back to me 2%. I take it all the time, especially if I know the person. Right? Make sense? Anyone questions on flips? Because I don't talk much about flips. All right, cool. All right, so we got about three different ways of evaluating real estate on buy and hold. So cap rate's the first one, and we talked about this a little bit before. So the cap rate is the expected yearly percentage return when buying a property in cash. We want to exclude principal and interest because we're buying it in cash, okay? So, but technically the way that I define it is it's the net operating income, and we, we go back to the question, divided by the purchase price plus the immediate renovation. So when you talk about a distressed property, there's different parts to it. If you have to replace a roof, if you have to replace a heating system, right? Well then that should, it's kind of part of the purchase price. Because if they had a good roof or had a good hitting system, they would have made more money on the property. Okay? So if you buy a property for $100,000, but you have to put $40,000 into it immediately, then I believe that the cap rate should be based on that immediate renovation. Now, if you're renovating a kitchen and you're raising the rents because you're renovating the kitchen, that doesn't go in there because that's now an enhancement on the value of the property that will give you a higher net operating income. Does that make sense? And this is where we can get into pro formas and everything else again, where, well, I'm raising the rents because of the fact I'm, 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 I'm in increasing the value of the property, okay? So the net operating income is the gross income minus your total expenses. In this case, we're doing including the amortized expenses. The gross income is the total income received from a tenant. That would be any rents and fees, parking, storage, whatever else. And then the total expenses is the real expenses you incur plus it, the expenses that you would be estimated to incur. What does that mean? What are expenses that you would be estimated to incur? So, go ahead. Uh, CapEx. Yeah, CapEx would be a perfect example, right? You might not have a roof in the year that you're talking about, but over the next 30 years you should. So you should capitalize 1 30th of that roof in an estimated expense. What are other ones? Vacancy, bad debt, right? Yeah, you might have a full year where all your units are completely occupied, but you might have a year where a bunch of them are, are not occupied for three or four months. That doesn't necessarily mean that this year you were terrible and the property performed so poorly, and this year it performed so well. You want to smooth out that natural variability in it by estimating long-standing um, vacancy bad debt. So, so what I'll ask this question, because this is a good one. What do you guys see as a cap, um, a cap rate for a property in Hartford? Anyone? No? Or, or Waterbury? You're right. So what, what are, quote me some. What are estimates of, of, of cap rates that you've seen in Waterbury and Hartford? 9-11. So I, before this whole craziness in the market, I actually saw 20%. So here's the question. Is it really a 20% cap rate? No. The vacancy and bad debt number is left out of it. And what is the vacancy and bad debt in Hartford versus West Hartford? Do you think it's similar? No. The vacancy rate in Hartford is over 10%. And the vacancy rate in West Hartford is probably 2%. Right? So it's 8% right there just on vacancy. Right? And that doesn't go one to one to the cap rate. But the point is that people that sell in Hartford and Waterbury will quote higher cap rates. It's all a lie because they're not pricing in the appropriate things. My dad in Hartford, I told you, he sold three properties in his life. One was Hartford. Let me ask you guys a question. How many times do you think he had the copper stolen from his property? I think once. Learned from it. Twice? What do you think? 